Thank you for participating in the 2020 Virtual Veggie Research Tour. My name is Jen Zabonetskaya, and I'm a graduate student at Michigan State University. Today I'll be giving you an update on the research I've been doing throughout the past year, looking at asparagus beetles, their overwintering biology, and creating different integrated pest management strategies for their control. For today's agenda, we'll be first looking at the results of the 2020 insecticide trial. Then we'll discuss where asparagus beetles may be overwintering throughout your fields, and then what materials they particularly like to overwinter in. We'll end the video with a look into the field, showing you a little bit more about my research. At the end of the virtual field day, we'll be having a Q&A, so if you have any questions at all, I'd be happy to answer them. So we initially planned on having our 2020 insecticide trial in May during harvest. But due to the current situation, we conducted it post-harvest in early July. We mowed back the stalks to have a more of a harvest environment for the beetles. We used nine different insecticide treatments, a mix of conventional and organic, all which had a 24-hour pre-harvest interval. We released a total of 380 adult beetles, 10 beetles in each pot, and an extra 120 throughout the field. It's important to note that we didn't use enclosures in this trial, so beetles were free to go wherever. We then waited 24 hours and assessed how many beetles and the number of eggs that remained on plants, and the following were the results. I first wanted to say that this is preliminary data, and the results will definitely need to be explored more. But on the left, you can see the average adult asparagus beetles that were found alive on each plant, and on the x-axis you can see each treatment. You can see that the control, which had no insecticide application, had the highest amount of beetles, which is what we'd expect. The neem oil and the permethrin had the second highest amounts of beetles, with the entrust, corrigin, and half rate of carbaryl having a significantly lower amount of beetles than the control. No beetles were found in the sale, full strength carbaryl, or pyganic. It's important to mention that permethrin typically works better for asparagus beetle larvae, which may explain why it wasn't as successful for adult beetles. Additionally, the pyganic seems like it could potentially be a good option for treatment of asparagus beetles, but further exploration is needed to confirm this. Similar results were found for the number of eggs found on each asparagus stalk. The highest number of eggs were found on the control, where permethrin and neem oil were found at lower levels. And trust, corrigin, and the half rate of carbaryl were significantly lower than the control, demonstrating efficacy in these treatments. No beetles were found in the sale, full strength carbaryl, or the pyganic. Again, these are preliminary results, and further exploration is needed. Another part of my project has involved looking at where throughout asparagus fields asparagus beetles are choosing to overwinter in. In the winter of 2019, I surveyed seven asparagus fields in Oceana and Cass County. I surveyed three different areas in each asparagus field. The asparagus field itself, the weed margin, and the surrounding woodlot. I took samples from each area, such as leaf litter, old asparagus stalks, and woody debris back to the lab to search for overwintering asparagus beetles. We then assessed the beetles for survival to see if they were dead or alive. Here you can see on the y-axis that it represents the average adult beetles found per one meter squared sample, and on the x-axis you can see where these beetles were found, either in the asparagus field, weed margin, or woodlot. You can see here that most of the beetles, both alive and dead, were found within asparagus fields. No alive beetles were found within the weed margin, but some dead beetles were found there. Both alive and dead beetles were found in the woodlots, although a lot fewer than within the asparagus field. This is still preliminary data and we plan on collecting more data in the winter of 2020 to further explore this question. Another question that I've been focusing on is, what materials do beetles overwinter in? Beetles have been previously observed overwintering in a variety of substrates, such as asparagus stalks, under bark, and within leaf litter. So I decided to explore this question further by seeing which substrate led to the highest beetle survival. To do this, we constructed 100 overwintering cages, as you can see here. We placed five different substrate treatments containing either thick bark, thin bark, asparagus stalks, deciduous leaves, or coniferous leaves or pine leaves. We set 50 boxes at the asparagus research farm in Hart and 50 at the entomology farm in East Lansing. 
Each treatment was replicated 10 times. We placed 10 adult asparagus beetles in each cage and secured it, leaving them to overwinter in the substrate. In the spring, we opened up the boxes and assessed the beetle survival of each box. The following were the results. On the y-axis, we have the average adult beetles that survived per cage, and on the x-axis, we have the five different treatments. Coniferous leaves, deciduous leaves, stalks, thick bark, and thin bark. Here we can see that survival was highest within the deciduous leaves and the stalks, with thick bark, thin bark, and coniferous leaves having the lowest survival. There wasn't any significant results when looking at mortality, so I decided to look at the differences between beetle survival between locations. We found quite a few differences when comparing beetle survival in overwintering cages between the East Lansing and Hart locations. We found significantly higher survival in deciduous leaves and stalks in Hart in comparison to East Lansing. We find this to be a very interesting result and hope to explore this further. We also monitored average temperatures that the beetles were exposed to in each substrate and we're analyzing that as well. I wanted to give a special thanks to the members of the Sundry Lab, Ben Whirling, John Baker, the Michigan Asparagus Commission, MSU Extension, Project Green, and of course all the participating asparagus growers that let me use their fields. Thank you so much and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. My name is Jen Zavalinskaya, and today I'll be showing you a glimpse inside an asparagus field. Today I'm at an asparagus field at the Student Organic Farm at Michigan State University. Although it might be a little bit different from your asparagus field, it shares a lot of qualities. So you may be wondering what exactly I'm doing when I'm coming to your asparagus field and serving for beetles. Today I'll show you a little demonstration of some of the surveying tools I use when coming to survey your field for asparagus beetles. This asparagus field has both female and male plants, which can harbor both common asparagus beetles and spotted asparagus beetles. But today we'll be focusing on the common asparagus beetle. As you may know, asparagus beetles are specialist insects that will only consume asparagus as a food source. They create significant damage to asparagus throughout egg, larval, and adult stages. During harvest, beetle populations seem to appear even after repeated spraying and treatment. Our research has really been trying to answer the question of where beetles may be coming from. One of our tentative explanations is their overwintering habitat. As a result, We've been focusing on year-round monitoring of asparagus beetles with a special emphasis on their overwintering to understand more about their biology and better ways to control them. To do that, I start with monitoring their activity throughout the fall. A typical tool I use is this measuring tape. I typically measure out 25 meter transects and count all asparagus beetle eggs, larvae, and adult beetles within those 25 meters. Then I space each transect by 50 meters so I can cover a majority of your field. Here's an example of me laying out a 25 meter transect. Now I'll count all the beetles that I find along this transect. I look super close at all of the asparagus fern and stalks looking for all life stages of asparagus beetles. Then I count them on my tablet. You may be wondering how I'm covering in your entire field as some of them are really large. Well, I'm not. I'm actually usually focusing on asparagus field edges that are surrounded by woodlots. Since we know asparagus beetles tend to overwinter in these woodlots, I found it super interesting to look at the populations around those woodlots. This woodlot that surrounds me here is a good example of a woodlot you might find surrounding your asparagus field. Although this one does not have a lot of pine trees, I found a variety of different trees surrounding asparagus fields. For my winter sampling, I collected samples from asparagus fields themselves, weed margins like this, and also within woodlots. By locating these beetle hotspots throughout asparagus fields, we can try to figure out what types of landscapes, habitats, and even specific tree species may be associated with these beetle hotspots. By understanding what types of habitat beetles prefer, we can target pest management efforts more efficiently.
Thank you for taking a glimpse into an asparagus field with me today. I hope you learned a little bit more about my research and asparagus beetle surveying. I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end if you have any. Thank you.